Well, hello everyone, it is Ben Hardy here, and in today's video, I'm going to be talking about cars that I am potentially looking at buying in the next few months. And so I feel like pretty self explanatory. But as always, before we get in the video, if you want to save time and money, the next time you purchase a car, link to my car buying guide in the description down below. And then if you want to see more videos just like this, then I recommend you subscribe because I post content every single day. Let's get into it. before we dive into the cars that I'm looking at purchasing, let's quickly talk about the current garage and then why I'm considering adding a vehicle to the garage. So first off, the first vehicle I have is a 2021 Ford F-150 Raptor. And this is supposed to be my daily driver, but it's actually my wife's daily driver right now because her daily driver is at the Land Rover dealership because it's already broken within the first 100 miles. And that's my second car, which is a 2023 Land Rover Defender. It's supposed to be the wife's daily driver, but over the short term, it's gonna be my daily driver until I make sure that the vehicle is not gonna to continue to break. And if it continues to break, well, yeah, we're gonna to have to figure something out. Um, now the next vehicle I own is a 2022 Shelby GT500 with the track pack. This is supposed to be like an exciting car for the channel, but then also a weekend car because I've worked really, really hard over the last few years building this channel. And so I finally decided to treat myself and that was in the form of a GT500. And so this is a car that I don't plan on driving a lot because well, it has 18,000 plus dollars in carbon fiber options that yeah, if they get damaged, that's gonna be a big hit to the wallet. And frankly, I, I feel like to keep that car special and exciting, I, I shouldn't drive it all the time. And then the last vehicle is a 2022 Jeep Wrangler Rubicon 392 that is bright pink. Everyone knows and loves that Jeep. Now that was actually supposed to be my wife's original daily driver. That's why I bought it. And that's why it's pink because, well, she loves the color and I happen to also love the color as well. But we found out pretty quickly that she is not exactly a Jeep girl. She loves how it drives and she actually likes the sound and she likes the acceleration. But when you start to daily drive that Jeep, it wears off pretty fast because there's like not a lot of sound insulation. The exhaust is just loud enough that it's annoying. The suspension's not comfortable. And she also was pregnant for most of the time that we've owned that vehicle and getting in and out of that just too much of a hassle. And so now it's kind of turned into more of a weekend toy. And I also think just like the GT500, that's what keeps that vehicle super enjoyable. When you just like take it around the block every so often and then take it on off-road adventures, then it's like you really enjoy the V8 and you don't really care about all the lack of daily drivableness with it. And so this obviously leads me into talking about why I am considering adding another car to my garage because I already have so many vehicles. And if you don't know, for this main channel, I also receive vehicles every so often from automakers to test for a week. And whenever I have those vehicles, that is what I daily drive because when I post a review on these vehicles that I get from automakers, I want my review to be able to reflect someone who's actually lived with the car for a week. I don't want to basically just receive the car, make a review, and then tell you guys, oh, this is a great car to live with. And you know, at that situation, I wouldn't know. I, I actually daily drive the car for 500 miles on average. And then I tell you guys what I actually think about the car. However, there are a lot of times during the year where I don't have a manufacturer car. And so I obviously have to daily drive one of my vehicles. And now that we happen to own a Land Rover Defender that hasn't been the most reliable, it's kind of got me thinking that maybe I should add another vehicle that is slightly more reliable that I can drive around while the Defender's broken so then the wife can drive around the Raptor and we're not gonna have any weird transportation issues. And I know that some people might say, hey, just go and drive the Wrangler. And that's what I've been doing currently. And I can tell you, I have absolutely been hating it. And I actually kind of hate the Wrangler right now because again, like I said, the Wrangler is a ton of fun, but like I just did a trip up to Layton, Utah yesterday and um, round trip, I think is about like 140, 150 miles roughly. I might be off of my numbers by a little bit, but it's a lot, it's well over hundred miles for the round trip. And by the end of it, I, I like, I didn't even want to look at the Jeep. I was like this, because it's so like on the highway, it is so loud. Like all you can hear is just the rumble from the exhaust, which again, sounds good when you're doing fun enthusiast driving, but when you're just trying to commute a hundred plus miles, it, it definitely gets old uh, soon. And so something that, you know, I guess is a little bit more comfortable when, again, the Defender is in the shop, which naturally it probably will be, I, I think that it's worth looking into at least. So the first vehicle that I'm looking into that I actually will buy regardless of what happens is the new Ford Bronco Raptor. So if you don't know, I have a really good relationship with several Ford dealers here in Utah, but more specifically the Ford in Provo. I've purchased like six cars from them at this point, I think. I, I've lost track because I bought so many cars from them. Um, but the conversation we've had is 
as soon as they get an available like allocation for a Bronco Raptor that is not going to be one that is handpicked by Ford, they will let me order one. I just don't know when that's going to happen. And Bronco's just got another set of constraints in them with the regular Bronco. Like you can't get a hard top anymore and you can't get a Sasquatch package anymore. And so I'm sure that Bronco Raptors are going to be constrained even more than they already are. And so I'm just like... I, I would love to have one of these. I just don't know when I'm going to be able to get it. And, you know, the Bronco Raptor compared to the Wrangler is so much better from a daily driver perspective. Uh, the suspension is more comfortable. Seats are more comfortable. And the biggest thing is the top insulation. Although it's a big block of cheese like the Wrangler, it's so much quieter on the interstate that it, with that same latent drive, if I was doing that in the Bronco Raptor, I would not have the same, like, I just want to get rid of this vehicle because it's so uncomfortable at the end of the uh, drive. And so that would be one that I think would be great. But again, it's just, it's, it's up in the air as to when I will actually get it. Like at this point, I'm just guessing like I won't get one until like next year or plus. And so that leads me into looking at cars that I could get today. And the cars that I'm looking most into are more affordable manual transmission cars that either have all wheel drive or front wheel drive. And basically I'm describing hot hatches um, or, you know, sporty cars like the WRX. So these are the cars. And I've made a poll about this to see, you know, what people wanted to see, but um, the, the new WRX, the new Honda Civic type, R, the new GR Corolla, um, the new Volkswagen Golf R, or a Golf uh, GTI. Now, the reason I say manual transmission is first off, in today's market, if you get a manual transmission car, resale value is going to be a lot better. And that's very important to me because I don't like to lose money on cars that I own. I try to break even, make a little bit of money. If I lose a little bit of money, it's fine because the content on the car will generally pay for it. But I don't want to buy a car with the assumption that the videos are going to make enough money to pay for it, right? I know a lot of YouTubers do that. I don't do that. I like to be financially conservative because I don't want my YouTube channel to go out of business because I made a bunch of stupid car purchases. Um, so regardless, I think that any of these cars could bring a lot of fun to the channel because again, I haven't had a hot hatch on the channel since the Focus RS. And if you guys remember, the Focus RS wasn't exactly the best ownership experience for me because I got pulled over like twice within the first month of ownership and I wasn't even doing anything crazy with the car. So first off, I never street race because like, I, I think that that just shouldn't be a thing. Like anyone that tells me that they street race, I'm like, I, yeah, I don't want anything I have to do with that. Like I just like, if you want to race, go on a racetrack, or if you're going to drive faster, do it on a road where nobody else is on. Right. Um, but, but anyways, aside from that, I got pulled over the first time for going like five miles over the speed limit. And the second time also for going five miles over the speed limit. Now I wasn't doing anything crazy. I was like, just going with the flow of traffic and caught basically singled me out and then pulled me over. And I asked both cops, I'm like, so is the car that I'm driving kind of the reason why you pulled me over? And they're like, yeah, people that drive these cars tend to street race and this and that. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So it kind of soured me on the whole hot hatch thing because it's like, well, if I drive this, I'm going to get pulled over more often. However, I am willing to give hot hatches another chance. Now there are benefits and downsides to all of these cars. If we start with the WRX, this is the car that's actually the least expensive with the purchase price. You can currently find base model manual transmission WRX is brand new for under original MSRP. So you're talking about under $30,000 for an all wheel drive car with a manual transmission and mid 200s with the horsepower, which is pretty dang impressive. Uh, however, the downside with the WRX is I wouldn't want a base model. I'd want a loaded up one, not because I have to have a bougie car, but you have to understand I drive over 30,000 miles a year. And so if I'm going to be in a car for a lot of time, I want something that has some creature comfort so that I'm actually comfortable during those long drives. The other downside with the WRX is you can't get any of the cool options unless you get an automatic transmission. So you can't get like the adaptive suspension and you can't get the cool Recaro seats, which I think is a huge downside. I just reviewed a WRX GT back to back with a manual. I loved how the manual drove, but I liked the suspension on the automatic a lot more. I haven't posted the automatic review on the channel yet. It's actually posting the same day as this video is posting, um, I believe. And so that's another downside is Subaru just has messed up the packaging on the new WRX. So I'd probably have to put some money in the form of modification into the car to make it so that it would drive how I think uh, the, the car should drive. The next one is the Volkswagen Golf GTI. Another big downside about this is the fact that it is front wheel drive, which I'm still not a huge fan of front wheel drive cars unless it's the Honda Civic Type R. Um, and then the other thing is going to be availability with this car. It's not bad, but WRX availability is definitely better. And then the other thing that I worry about with the GTI's resale value, it's good right now, but historically GTI resale value is usually not all that good, especially when you compare it to something like the WRX, for example. 
Now the next three cars are the ones that are obviously gonna be harder to get. So that'd be Volkswagen Golf R, Honda Civic Type R, and then the new GR Corolla. Now I have done searches for all these cars and I've managed to find all of these cars for or under MSRP. The only one that I found under MSRP is the Volkswagen Golf R. GR Corolla and Honda Civic Type R, MSRP is the best that I could find, which considering the market on those cars, that would actually be a pretty good deal. Now, going through each of the cars, I haven't driven any of them, which is kind of sad because I'm a car journalist. I'm supposed to drive cars, but getting access to these cars to drive is really difficult, again, because of how few of them are built. However, I will be reviewing a Honda Civic Type R in the very near future. A subscriber that lives here in Utah just bought one, and they're gracious enough to let me review their car. So, yeah, I'll be able to drive that soon. Regardless, I've watched reviews on all of the cars from a bunch of different outlets, and what they've basically said is with the GR Corolla, it's kind of like a mix between the last generation STI and then also the Ford Focus RS. I've obviously driven both those vehicles quite substantially, and so that gives me a pretty good idea of how the Corolla drives, which I think is great from an enthusiast standpoint, but I don't think it's great from a daily driver standpoint. I think that the car is probably going to be a little bit harsher than what I'm looking for. Now, with the new Honda Civic Type R, a lot of outlets have said that it drives very similar to the previous generation, but it's a little bit bigger and it's still pretty harsh with the suspension. But the Civic Type R doesn't have suspension that's as harsh as the Corolla is what everyone has stated. And so it seems like it's a little bit more daily drivable. And I had a chance to daily drive a Honda Civic Si for a week. And so all I have to say is if the new Civic Type R drives about the same as the SI in terms of the suspension comfort, but maybe a little bit firmer, I would be okay with that. Uh, and then the last one is going to be the Volkswagen Golf R. Everyone said that this is like the sweet spot because it has the most comfortable suspension. It's really fun to drive and it, it just pretty much does everything really well. And I could get it in automatic, which I frankly wouldn't do because manual transmissions are just a lot more fun. Um, but it, it seems like it's kind of like the best all around car. So that is pretty much going to sum things up for today's video, talking about the cars that I'm potentially potentially looking at purchasing because of the whole Land Rover Defender situation with it being super reliable and dependable and like the best vehicle on the planet. Yeah, it's kind of hilarious. But if you guys want to make suggestions of vehicles you think I should look into, then just comment those down below. But what I do want to say before you comment, do not put any vehicles that are expensive because I am not looking at buying expensive vehicles. I understand the Bronco Raptor is an expensive vehicle, but I have a big Raptor following on this channel. And so I know I can get a return on the content. And also Bronco Raptors have insane resale value. So I know that I could also, I'd be fine if I needed to sell it uh, basically. But outside of that, I want the car to be attainable. And that's something that I want to continue with uh, on this channel. I know a lot of YouTubers will start to buy crazier and crazier cars as they make more and more money on their YouTube journey. I don't plan on doing that ever because I just don't think that that's relatable for the average viewer. And I don't think that's exciting from a content perspective. I think that if I go and buy like a, like a Honda Civic Type R, for example, the content on that is far more exciting because like you yourself could probably eventually go out and buy a Honda Civic Type R one day if you can't afford to buy one uh, today, for example. Whereas if I went and bought a Lamborghini or something like that, then like sure content on that could be fun, but like how many people are ever going to be able to afford a Lamborghini, let alone the maintenance cost on a Lamborghini. And so that's something that I, I, I want to mention. I've kind of mentioned this over the course of several videos, but like, I guess we're, we're putting like a hard rule on this. So please do not like suggest cars that are not attainable for the average Joe, because I don't have an interest in purchasing cars that aren't attainable. And I know some people might comment, Ben, you have a $103,000 GT500. That's not attainable for the average Joe. Well, my GT500 happens to be a Ford Mustang, which is built off of like a 20 something thousand dollar rental car. Like the average Joe can afford a GT Mustang. And yeah, like, yeah, the GT500 is expensive, but at the same time, I feel like if you were smart with your money, even if you didn't make a massive amount of money, you could eventually afford to buy a GT500 yourself. Because although my car is $100,000 today, I don't think it'll be $100,000 in 10 years from today. But anyways, that is gonna sum things up with today's video. Give me your suggestions. I'll see ya.